Ladies and gentlemen, in this RedGamingTech.com video, I, Crimson Rain, will be going through a comparison, if you will, between the PlayStation 4, Orbis, and Xbox 720 in the technical ter uh, terms, at the least. This is of January the 20th, 2013, and remember, most of this stuff is still not 100% confirmed, but we can at least, you know, go through what is known at the moment and what is currently thought of for the current systems. So both systems are going to be absolute monsters in comparison to the current generation and I was a PS3 and 360 of course and it's going to be very impressive upon launch. We're fairly certain that both systems are going to be featuring eight core CPUs and we're also fairly certain that these CPUs are going to be clocked at 1.6 gigahertz which may seem low for those of you who are familiar with more modern day CPUs which are generally at 3 GHz plus but there are reasons behind this which we'll go into as the video develops. Before we go into the CPU itself let's talk about RAM. I've been vocal upon this before that I've said a lot of systems don't give enough memory to the consoles. In other words, they just simply do not have enough for the task and therefore as the system ages, well, texture, details and everything else are somewhat lowered. This has been certainly evident on the PlayStation 2 and PlayStation 1. So what about the Orbis? Well, it seems to feature 4 gigabytes of GDDR5. This is extremely fast memory indeed, and generally speaking, is reserved for the latest PC graphics cards, which you're going to be seeing, for example, the GTX 680, that type of thing. It's extremely fast and gives a ridiculously high memory bandwidth. But the actual operating system itself will have 512 megabytes reserved for it. This is not unexpected, obviously, next generation of consoles, just like how, for example, the PS3 and 360 have the dashboards built in. It makes sense that the operating system itself on this particular system is going to have a larger uh, footprint, so to speak. This is very different, however, to the next generation Xbox. It seems that the next generation Xbox, also known as Durango, is going to have 8 gigabytes in total. However, and this is a big minus, is going to be a DDR3. So, straight off the bat, if more RAM is good, in other words, if, for example, high resolution textures, lots of detail, that type of thing, things that swallow RAM whole, it seems that Durango is going to be the better system. However, for things that require a lot of memory bandwidth real quick, it seems like the PS4 is going to be the better. However, it seems that from the sources that um, many articles have speculated upon, it seems that we're going to have 3 gigabytes total is reserved for the operating system. So in other words, the Durango is going to have a far larger operating system offhand. However, that still means that Durango is still going to have a far more memory than the PS4. We're not actually sure exactly what memory bandwidths are going to be, as obviously it depends on what speed these memories are clocked at. Both systems have gone with the AMD route for the graphics card processing power, which I'm sure will have upset some uh, people at NVIDIA to say the least, considering that the previous generation of PlayStation did indeed go with, of course, the NVIDIA based solution. The Orbis does indeed support a Radeon, indeed it seems to be using a Radeon 7970M. Uh, the M denotes it's going to be a mobile based solution. Why mobile? Well, primarily because of the reduction in both heat and just power requirements, which are obviously very crucial when developing a console. One of the problems with consoles, of course, is generally speaking, they try to pack a lot onto the same board. In other words, the actual space to release the heat is very limited in comparison to say, your PC, which of course can have many fans. And if you guys remember the Xbox 360 fiasco, this is a small digression. The Xbox, Xbox 360, the red, red, the red ring of death, if I can get the words out, one of the primary reasons for this was actually heat. And basically what would happen is it would cause the board to somewhat bend. And when it did so, it would basically uh, cause the solder, the solder, if you, however you wish to pronounce it, to become disjointed. And that's why the towel trick worked, which I won't go into in this particular video. So yeah, um, heat is basically the mortal enemy. However, the Orbis isn't exactly 
using the 7970. Now, the 7970 usually runs at 850 megahertz and features 20 of AMD's graphics core and next compute units. However, the Orbis isn't quite like that. It's running only 800 megahertz, so it's a small, small step down, but also is shaving about 10% off of the graphics core next so it's only got 18 of them instead one of the primary reasons of course is a to reduce he um, costs there's a couple of reasons it pro reduces costs one of the primary ones is because of yield if quite simply speaking you don't have to have so many of the cores running that means that one or two of them can be faulty as the manufacturing process dictates and also when it's down clock lower a produces the heat b requires less power and c it means that more are going to be able to be binned and more able to be used as uh manufactured i'm not going to go into the whole you know how things are binned and everything else that would be a massively lengthy video so what about the Xbox 720, also known as Durango, well, things aren't quite so clear. As I've mentioned earlier, it is fairly certain that we're going to be seeing an AMD-based solution, but just how powerful it's going to be isn't known right now. It seemed at the beginning that actually Durango was going to be behind Orbis in terms of actual raw GPU power, but now there's some shadow of doubt cast upon that. And they're actually saying that it's possible there's going to be some task-specific hardware that's going to be acting in conjunction with the GPU, the graphics processing unit, the graphics card, however you wish to say it. In other words, it's going to be offloading some of the responsibility. Just how much it's going to be doing, if it's going to be doing at all, in other words, if it's even going to exist, and more to the point, how effective any of this is going to be it remains to be seen. Now, one issue that I'm pretty sure many of you guys will know is physics in games is becoming increasingly demanding. I am probably going to be producing a physics-based video very soon, but physics, NVIDIA have done a really good job on it. Um, Batman Arkham City is a fantastic example. If you happen to run a NVIDIA graphics card and you turn, let's say, physics all the way up to max, you can definitely see a difference. Now, I'm not saying that it looks crap on AMD hardware. I'm not saying that at all. However, in my personal opinion, physics in some games can look really, really nice. Um, Batman is one example, Mirror's Edge. Um, and another one, of course, would be Metro 2033, and of course, the next generation of Metro titles as well. The issue, really, with hardware physics is because the video basically have a, a massive lid upon it, in other words, they basically got a stranglehold upon it. A lot of games developers don't put the time and the you know money into actually researching and developing these hardware subroutines. There's a simple reason because let's say 50% of people own an AMD card, and obviously they don't, but let's just say 50% did. That means 50% of your gaming market literally are unable to enjoy the features, and obviously some games are also sponsored by AMD. Regardless of the fact, the simple reasoning behind it is that physics is becoming increasingly taxing on hardware and cpus are ill-equipped to deal a lot with hardware physics i'm not going to go into the whole reasons behind there but it's just basically to do with the the way that cpus and gps are uh, uh, designed i'm sorry it does appear however that orbis does have something in the pipeline pardon the pun to do with physics however um, this is mostly to do with the cpu gpu type of layout uh, we're not 100 percent on this obviously right now things are still up in the air so in a couple of weeks time i could be you know given completely different information but it does seem that there is some dedicated physics hardware in there which is obviously very good news there's a couple of reasons for this one it offloads a lot of work from the actual cpu slash gpu unit and the second reason is it makes games look a lot better for example dust and debris and particles that type of thing it seems that there's an additional unit on this which contains a gpu like compute functions which are pretty much there to ease the burden of physics-based operations, as I've mentioned before, like dust and debris, which really, really, really stress CPUs, at least to do it in a very good way. Uh, I'll give you a simple example, even a fighting game, and that would be cloth details. And for example, let's say your, let's say your character, let's say Street Fighter, and let's say your, you know, Ken, 
and you're against Ryu, and you see Ryu throwing a fireball. Well, let's say as Ryu throws that fireball, his feet move. So let's say you had a very, very good physics in the game. You would, for example, see Ryu go into the position with the cloth, and I was his clothing would move accordingly. Assuming it wasn't actually animation um, in terms of 2D, let's say it was 3D-based engine. You would see his, you know, cloth moving of his clothes. You would see, for example, his stance changing, his feet sweeping perhaps the ground slightly, which may kick up a little bit of dust. And let's say as he's uttering the immortal words Hadoken, he would, as of course the Hadoken forms, it may push up dust and debris from the surrounding areas, maybe even cause his clothes to billow back a little bit. Um, and for example may even cause some structural damage in surrounding areas so obviously let's say Ken was to block that uh, Hado Ken he would absorb obviously the damage and let's say his clothes would be pushed back and so forth and therefore obviously it would look pretty darn awesome as you guys can maybe visualize if you guys have ever seen Street Fighter anime well there you go now there have been a couple of rumors on this as I've mentioned previously, one of them is that this core is going to be a custom AMD Fusion core with a separate discrete GPU for this purpose. However, it appears that this is no longer the case, and instead it's going to be as well an internally known as processor known as Liverpool. Sony have done some pressing when it comes to this type of integration before with the PlayStation Vita for example um, as of time of recording this video it's the only mobile GPU processor that has ever been combined with a quad-core Amex uh, A9 the processor with and that's with a PowerVR SGX 543MP4 sorry for the ridiculously long fee name as I've mentioned previously, one of the previous reasons for them going for the 7970M, or at least the basis upon it, is power draw. Now, I mentioned also earlier about the RROD, or the yellow light of death for the PS3, and the 7970 requires around 75 watts of power. Bear in mind there has been a reduction on clock speed, which not exactly massive, as I said previously, around 50 MHz, and also a couple of units disabled. This means that overall the whole system is going to sail under the 200 watts of the previous generation systems, in other words Xbox 360 and PS3 upon their launch. So what about the actual CPU? I've skirted around this issue a few times and I've mentioned it's going to be 8 core uh, CPUs, which as I've mentioned before clocked at 1.6 gigahertz. So the CPU is of course the real heart of the machine and it's increasingly called upon to do a number of very complicated tasks. It does appear that both systems, that would of course be the Xbox 720 and the PS4, are going to be using AMD's new Jaguar technology, which is currently of course being researched by AMD. Now obviously this technology has got to be pretty darn impressive considering how both systems are using it and it is. I'm going to go into a very brief overview and I'm probably going to make another video of this because I don't want this video to become extremely sprawling and kind of off point. Now the chipset itself has been created for basically lightweight devices or low power based machines. Yet at the same time it's also been created in, well, need to kick ass is basically what it comes down to. In other words, to not sacrifice a massive amount of performance that a couple of the generations ago we were extremely used to with mobile device devices. This is not really the same thing as what we've got now. Instead we've got very, very powerful, very cheap to run in terms of actual, you know, per watt based systems. The basic premise of this architecture is to enable x86 multi-core microprocessors with very, very low power consumption. However, it is improved drastically compared to x86 microchips of right now and indeed is hoping to enter the market of ULP chips powered by Jaguar. It does this in a few ways. One of them is increasing the amount of IPC or executed instructions per clock and also integration of more instructions in other words actually what the system can do on the chip itself and by utilizing things such as clock gating and unit uh, redesigning uh, it's basically reduced the p uh, power requirements or 
to put it another way, improve their power efficiency. It seems that these uh, CPUs are going to be manufactured using the 28NM manufacturing process. However, at a later date, this could actually be shrank further. So it would go to actually 20NM. Each actual Jaguar powered acceleration processing unit, which is a bit of a mouth to say, uh, there can actually be four. And the actual idea is two megabytes of shared cache is shared between the four, so that's 512 each. Now, I don't really think it's exactly a massive deal on the consoles, but on other mobile devices, the actual reason behind this is that you can actually disable each of those uh, cores as necessary, including the cache, obviously, which will reduce power requirements. That might also be useful, for example, if you're on the dashboard, that type of thing, so the system won't require so much juice, basically, to run. Now, the previous generation, also known as Bobcat, has been saved a little bit. It's basically had its clock speed boosted 10% compared to Bobcat. And how it basically does that is by integrating a longer pipeline to do this. And also another small point, or actually quite a major one, is there's also quite a lot of extra data sets that have been incorporated, including SSE4 uh, and 1, SSE4, 2, AES, uh, PC. L M U L uh, B I B M I F one six C and uh, A V X, as well as Mov B as well. Now going back to the actual overhead in terms of the memory for both systems. I know I'm going backwards and forwards here, but hey, sometimes you have to do it. I'm getting a bit dizzy as well, gang. Uh, it seems that both systems are going to have a bit of a CPU and memory overhead. And it seems that in terms of the way Microsoft are doing things, it's going to be a little bit interesting. There could be up to two cores reserved for customizable apps, which Microsoft want to run in the background. What those apps are and how it's exactly going to do so is not exactly clear. Whereas on the other hand, it seems that the PS4 isn't like that. It seems that the PS4 does not have these things. Now, it is possible that Microsoft are not going to go this route, as I was, as I've said previously, this is mostly rumours and conjecture, and while some of it could be considered fairly accurate information, just how accurate is unknown. For example, it could only do that with some games, or for example, the technology could be disabled for more complicated games. However, if it is true, it could mean that the uh, Durango is actually somewhat less powerful in terms of raw performance available to the developers of games than the Orbis. Once again, this is not 100% confirmed yet. The Xbox 360 is, well, apparently still using the DirectX 11. It's basically a refined version for DX11, while the Orbis is not using DX11. Instead, it's going to be using the same API uh, in the PS3 and the PS Vita, or a revised version, or should I say, of the same API, which would be libgcm for those of you who actually care. So what does all of this mean? I'm going to give a final quick tie-up. Well, it's quite convoluted, to say the least right now. Bear in mind that both the Xbox 360 and PS3 are fairly lengthy, uh, sorry, fairly old, I say not lengthy, and by around 2007, so let's say one to two years after the release of both systems, the PC hardware had moved on a lot in terms of the actual raw power available to these systems. Bear in mind, if you happen to be one of those people who saw, let's say Alan Wake, the original demo, uh, when let's say Intel was showing off the the Q6600 CPU back in the day, you could see that Alan Wake was actually very visually impressive. Now, obviously, it was held back deliberately on the PC, as it turns out. But regardless, in terms of raw power, both on the CPU, the GPU, and the actual amount of memory available, the PC just basically ruffle stomped it, I'll just be frankly honest. That's not a surprise. The equipment... Uh, in terms of cost, of course, was a lot higher and so forth. And I'll give you an example of this, a real quick one. Um, 
I happen to be one of those people who bought uh, Oblivion on the Xbox 360 when it was first released, and I really loved it. And then I had a I had a fairly modest system actually at the time, and then I decided, hey, you know what, I'm going to upgrade. And I think I got a, I think at the time it was a Radeon 4850, or it might have been a GT. No, actually, I'll lie to you guys. It was a, it was a GeForce. 8800 GTX and a few other bits and bobs and to be honest with you it just kicked the things butt um, that's simple it just really did it just made the game just look amazing on the PC it looked really impressive and you know what I, I did love console gaming I still love console gaming I love my PS3 I own a 360 as well I don't use it as much maybe as I should do to be honest with you but in terms of actual raw power the PC you know won out so you just have to remember that. So let's not talk about you know versus PC. Instead, let's more concern ourselves with it versus what it actually will do for us in terms of gaming. It is worth noting that, for example, consoles do not deviate from the original design. In other words, if I buy a PS3 right now, I have one of the original 40 gigabyte models, and I was really old and outdated, but hey, it does the job. If I was to buy a new PS3, I will not suddenly find that my new titles, you know, uh, I'd use another Street Fighter example, Super Street Fighter 4 will not suddenly look better, neither will Uncharted uh, 3 or Gears or Halo 4, for example, if I was to do the same for the Xbox 360, it's just not going to make a difference. In other words, the hardware doesn't stay, doesn't change. This means that as a development tool, it means that you can become very consistent and you know how to get all the tricks out of that hardware. This, of course, is not the same for PCs, which is one of the reasons it's so much more difficult to program for one, because obviously you don't know, for example, even if the person's got the same... Uh, AMD processor, even if you do have AMD, you might have the 7850, I might have the 7870, or and we could even be different RAM versions of that same graphics card, so it becomes very difficult to optimize. It is worth noting, however, that both the next generation systems, both Durango and Orbis, are a lot closer in terms of consoles than they were. Now, of course, we also have the Steam box, which is coming out soon-ish, um, in terms of, you know, reality. It's not that far away. Obviously, it's not you know going to be released tomorrow or anything, but even if you say, you know, it's released in another year or two years, the fact is that hardware can also keep growing and evolving. Which means, of course, that while the PS4 and uh, 36 or so, say, 720 cannot do this. It's probably worth noting as well that in terms of raw performance, these systems are going to be very impressive. So which one's going to actually be the faster? It's very, very difficult to know right now. I have a feeling that much like the 360 and PS3, it's going to heavily, heavily depend upon what eventual um, games are kind of tied into it. Also, as I've mentioned previously, because we don't know all the details yet, it becomes even more tricky to know this. But in my personal opinion, because of the overheads of the CPU, it's possible that Durango will have a somewhat disadvantage in that. But it's possible that, for example, the CPUs could be clocked slightly higher. Or it's possible, for example, that, you know, those dedicated cores will not always be used. It might only be used in certain titles, for example, those that more heavily feature biometric data or touchscreen data or what have you. It's very, very early to tell. However, one thing that is known is these systems are going to look very good natively in 1080p. The problem, of course, is let's say you're the games developer and let's say you release, I don't know, Killatron 1. By the time you want to release Killatron 3 in, let's say, four years' time after the original title, you cannot release it with the same graphics. It's just that simple. I, as a consumer, will not buy it from you, um, at least as willingly. I'll say, hey, hang on a minute, my friend. Where, where's the better graphics? Where's the better you know, resolution? Where's the you know, incredible physics? You know why can't I see you know the sweat particles from 50 yards away from this guy's face? And you will of course say 
nothing. You will just hang your head in shame. In reality, of course, you won't because you're a smart games developer and you always want to push the graphical boundaries. Not only because you want to impress consumers, but you also want to differentiate yourself from the market in those places. And that's, of course, you're a very small indie developer. And even then, you've got tools like the Unreal Engine, which is, of course, incredibly popular among developers and has done incredible work even on the 2D plane. My point being that you always, always, always have to push the graphical boundaries. But the problem with that is just by the simple fact that your hardware doesn't change, but the the desire to actually keep pumping out more complicated games increases, quite simply put, the same hardware cannot effectively keep outputting at 1080p. And that's exactly what happened to say the Xbox 360. A lot of the titles at the start were 720p natively. Uh, I'm not trying to single that out on the 360. It also happened to the PS3. I just used the 360 as an example. I'm not trying to play favourites here. But what I'm trying to say is quite simply put that while 720p was the standard on some games, this could not be maintained. And it's no fault of the developers or the console. I mean, maybe Microsoft should have stuffed in a bit more RAM, but I'm going to remain quiet on that for this particular point. However, what I am trying to tell you guys is, look, you can't realistically expect it to continue. What did happen is, of course, the Xbox 360 eventually sank from 720p to 600p, for example, on certain titles. In other words, it just internally um, upscaled it, which is fine and dandy and understandable. So... In three to four years after the generation of consoles is going to be released, obviously they're still going to get older and everything else. So you're not going to maybe natively expect 1080p. But they are natively going to look a lot better than current generation graphics. Now, what about if you're a PC gamer? What about if you're just listening to this video or looking out at the news, generally speaking, and you're a PC gamer and you're thinking, you know what, I actually have no desire to buy a PS4. Hey, maybe I'll buy one at Christmas if it goes down cheap, that's what you're thinking to yourself, you know, a couple of Christmases later. Well, I'd argue it's still a very, a very good thing that these systems are going to be good. And I, for one, I'm hoping that they're going to actually make PCs look somewhat outdated at the start. And I'll tell you why, even if they're a rival to it. And that might sound very un-PC gamer of me. And one of the simple reasons is because it will push development. I don't play games because, you know on PC because I want, you know, to say I'm a PC game, I play games on PC because I prefer the platform. But straight up, if the PS4 or, you know, 720 came out and it looked a lot better, I'd probably pick one up anyway because I'd want to cover it for you guys on the channel, but also because I want to see the awesomeness and, you know, I'm a gamer and I'm a tech head and everything else. Generally speaking, however, if we are seeing these improvements on the cores of the CPUs and everything else, this is going to translate towards PC and this means that we're going to see um, much more effective graphics processing units, maybe better physics and stuff on CPUs. All of it, in short, is going to benefit us as gamers for PC. And even if you're not a gamer, even if you're a casual gamer at most, and you just do video editing, or you do you know image editing, or you do sound editing, or you're you know you're a, a programmer or what have you, all of this is going to benefit you because your PC is just going to be faster, and that's just fantastic. Anyway, I have gone on this video for a long ass time now and I think it's un unfair of me to continue to waffle on to you guys. So I will cut this video short. Hopefully, hopefully we can have some discussions in the comments that do not result in, well, me having to get the fire extinguisher out. But on a serious note, I think it's going to be a very, very exciting time. What about the Wii U in all of this? Well, I think I'm going to hold my opinion back on that one for this particular video. However, what I am going to tell you guys real quick is that I'm extremely excited for the next couple of years ahead. So, yeah. Anyway, obviously, keep a, a lookout on the channel and I will cover it the best I can. So, anyway, take care of yourselves. Bye for now. And remember to leave some comments. What are you personally hoping for other than you know kick-ass graphics what are you personally hoping for on um, the next generation systems anyway i'm gonna cut this short so bye for now and take care of yourselves